Here in 1 Peter, let's read this amazing introduction to the letter, uh, letter that Peter writes. He would write another one. But this is 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen carefully uh, as Peter uh, introduces his letter and the rest of the things that he will say. Simon Peter, a bond servant of the apostle, an apostle rather of Jesus the Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust but also for this very reason giving all diligence to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge to knowledge self-control to self-control perseverance to perseverance godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love for if these things are yours and abound you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he had that he was cleansed from his old sins therefore brethren be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, in this body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, I must die, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me in the last chapters of the Gospel of John. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after I die, after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit or carried by the Holy Spirit, as we've said before. I've stated, I stated something several times in the past, and I'm going to say it again today uh, to remind us of that so that we can Properly orient ourselves. Orient ourselves means to position yourself, to place yourself. Orient ourselves to God, to Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit. These are the three that we must orient ourselves to, properly to. And this is what I've said, that we have made the study of prophecy a priority. Okay, We have made the study of prophecy a priority. Now, we've done this not because prophecy is a fascinating subject, because it is, obviously. When we hear about rather prophecy or the word prophecy, we usually think about predictions about the end of the world all the time, the end of the world. The book of Revelation always comes to mind, and with that, of course, comes the question about who the Antichrist is, what is the mark of the beast, you know, the one world order, the one world religion. Those are the things that we usually associate with prophecy. But we're not studying prophecy because it contains within it specific topics that, that captivate us, and we want to do that. Many have done that. Many, many are like that in the body of Christ. We're not going to do that. We haven't done this because it takes up such a large part of the Bible. 26% of the Bible deals with prophecy. There are over 1,800 prophecies in Scripture. We should study prophecy because of the law of prophecy demands it. The law of proportion says that if something 
is covered in a lot of places in the Bible. If it, there's a lot of information about a particular subject, a large proportion of the Bible is devoted to it, we should study it. And certainly we should study prophecy because the law of proportion applies to it, demands it, but we're not studying prophecy because it can't be ignored because it's so much of it in the Bible. This is how we need to understand prophecy. We've made prophecy a priority because the prophetic word is the word of God from the mouth of God that has created history. Let's think about prophecy that way. When we say prophecy here, we don't think about the Antichrist and the end of the age, uh, the end of the world, or Mark of the Beast. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. We're going to concern ourselves with this, this meaning and this understanding of the, bio, of the prophetic word. That it is the word of God from the mouth of God that has created history. All history. And it is the word that is guiding all spiritual and human activity that will create the future, what's going to happen tomorrow, and the consummation of history, the end of it. There is a history, there is an end to history, a consummation, a brain bought, brought together, all things being brought together to fulfill the plans and the purposes of God. Keep that in mind when we say prophecy or the study of the prophets or let's understand the prophets. We want to understand that this is the word of God from the mouth of God that has created history. One more time. It has created history and it is guiding and the only activity there is on the earth is spiritual activity and human activity. That's what's happening in the world. Spiritual activity, human activity. And God is guiding both. God is guiding both to create tomorrow and next year and the year to come. And then finally, the end of it all. The consummation of history. So let's look at an example of this real quickly. In Genesis chapter 1, let's look at this in, in, the, in the Bible. We know all this, but just listen. So listen, just listen, you don't have to turn and I'll go there in a little bit. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, God, the king, brings all creation into being by his spoken word. All things come into being by his spoken word. He creates the earth first and then he creates mankind. Mankind is given the privilege of co-ruling with God. We don't just live in the planet. Genesis says we are kings with God. We were created to be kings with God, co-rulers with God. Co-rulers over Everything that he has created by God's own word in Genesis 1 and 2. Everything that he has created and how it exists together in the beginning, he describes it as very good. Very good, what does that mean? It means that all creation is in right relationship to God and everything can function together as God created it and for the purpose for which he created everything. And he did it for this reason, to bring forth life. To bring forth life. In Genesis chapter 3, the serpent deceives Eve into disregarding the will of God. God, rather, Adam chooses to obey God's instructions and sin and death enter creation. When that happens, the relationship between God and mankind is severed, and mankind forfeits his position as co ruler with God, and this is called the fall. Now in Genesis 3.15, in response to the deception of the serpent and the sin of Adam and Eve, God speaks to the serpent and prophesies, prophesies about its ultimate destiny. God speaks to Adam and Eve and he prophesies what life will be like from that point on because of sin. So let me read Genesis 3. 15. Listen, just listen to this because we've, we've read it many times. You don't have to turn there. So he speaks to the serpent, God. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, remember, God is prophesying. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of the wife of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. 
with thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. God speaks to Adam and Eve, and he to the serpent and to Adam and Eve, and he prophesies about what life will be like because of what has just taken place. What did he say? He said that the serpent will always be under dominion. Eating dust doesn't mean that it's going to crawl and eat dust because it's close to the ground. That's a, that's a symbolic a symbolism, meaning his dominion, under dominion. The serpent will always be under dominion, God said to the serpent. There will be enmity between you and mankind, not the snake and mankind, but the one who who represents the snake, the adversary. There will be enmity with mankind, and at a set time in the future, the serpent will ultimately be destroyed by a man, the seed of the woman, which tells us that this man is going to be a special man because it means destroying a spiritual entity. And the only person that can destroy a spiritual entity is God himself. Of woman, he says, woman will experience painful conception and delivery. Of man, he says, man's life is going to be characterized by toil, hard labor, and he will eventually die and return to the dust. This is God prophesying. Okay? From this event in the Garden of Eden and what God said about it, what he prophesied, human history began to unfold. I want, to, I want you to pay close attention because it's important that we understand this. This as far as, far as prophecy and, and what it essentially is and how we want to understand it. What God prophesied, human history began to unfold. And this is what we need to know and begin to understand. History did not unfold in a series of random disconnected events. Okay? Because we think that way. We think that way. From the moment that we're able to understand, we just say that stuff is happening because stuff is happening. But we want to get rid of that and receive for ourselves the biblical worldview, the worldview that God has given us in Scripture, that everything is working itself out according to the prophetic word. Not random disconnected events, but according to God's prophetic word. According to His carefully ordered plan, sovereignly directed by his power and wisdom. And this is what makes the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, unique, distinct, and infinitely higher than the gods of the nations. And this is what makes the Bible, the scriptures, God's word, what makes it distinct from the sacred writings, sacred writings or the holy books of the nations. And why? This alone, this scripture alone is binding and authoritative for all mankind, for the entire world. The God of Israel does not exist within history. Listen carefully. The God that we worship, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He does not exist within history. He is not moved to action by the events of history. He doesn't react to things that happen in the world. He exists and he acts from outside of history because he is the one creating history by his word. And then he, he then guarantees the fulfillment of his word by covenant. By covenant. The promises of his covenants become the laws that direct and guide history. His covenants are his sworn testimony by his own name that by his power alone he will accomplish his predetermined plans and purposes. What is one predetermined plan? Is to destroy the serpent. He's doing it. Let's look at a couple of scriptures in Isaiah to see God's talking about himself in this way. This is not just me saying, oh, this, is what, this must be what the Bible means when it tells me this. No, let's God, let God let us. Let God tell us himself. In Isaiah 49, just a few verses, that are, there are many of them that say this very same thing. But in 46, Isaiah 46, beginning at verse 9, just two verses, 9 and 10. 
he tells Israel as they are preparing to go into exile, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end out of the beginning. Declaring the end out of the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, what I speak, have spoken shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Well, here's God telling us he's in charge of past history and future history. But it is going according to his word. In chapter 48, a couple of chapters forward, in chapter 48, verse 3, he says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. Now remember, he's already in the middle of history talking to Israel. And he's telling them, the past is my, is my doing. The future is going to be my doing. I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from me, from my mouth, and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. God, the one who speaks what he wants things to be, to look like, and then he sets about to make them come to be the way exactly the way he said they would be. The scriptures are authoritative and binding upon all mankind because it is the record of God's prophetic word and past history confirms the trustworthiness of God. How do you know that this Bible is true? Because it's also history and the history that is recorded here is the history that God has created. And you can find it. You can find it in books and you can go to the places on the, on the planet and see the marks of God's history. Past history, past history, that's the past, that's the future. Past history is the fulfillment of God's prophetic word. Past history is the fulfillment of God's prophetic word. I want us to see this from scripture. So let's see this from scripture that all mankind is living in the history created by the prophetic word. I want you to see this. I'm making statements and I want to show it to you from scripture. And I'm, making all, I'm saying all of this to make a point at the very end. In Genesis chapter 3, from Genesis chapter 3 to verse, from verse 15 to verse 24 that we read a little bit, a bit of a while ago. God speaks as a result of the deception of the serpent, the deception of Eve, the sin of Adam, and what is going to happen afterward. So the sin of Adam brought sin and death. That's what we read. The sin of Adam brought sin and death to all mankind. Since Adam, life became characterized by the curse and death. That's what we read at the very beginning. So the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 6, looking back to that history by the Holy Spirit, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. When God tells Adam, you shall surely die, dying you will die, history confirms it. The Apostle Paul confirms it in his word, in the word of the Spirit through him. Men die because of Adam. There is sin because of Adam. It passes through all men. And history, we see it in history. We see it in the earth that it is true. It is true. In Genesis, we read that a spiritual war began to rage. I will put enmity between you and the seed of the woman. A spiritual war began to rage. The kingdom of darkness positioned itself against mankind and the kingdom of God. That's what we understand from Genesis 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 13, 3 rather, and 14, and in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we read this. Paul writing, I fear, for I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted. For Satan himself transforms, or rather, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. This is Paul talking about that serpent in the garden. He's still doing what he did then. Just like God said that he would. He is at enmity with God the kingdom of God and with mankind. So Paul 
in light of that truth, warns believers. The Apostle Peter writes, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, as he did Eve. Because of sin and uh, the because sin perverted rather and became uh, because of let me read this again because of sin mankind perverted and became corrupt so that judgment and destruction was inevitable and it came for that I want to open uh, to Romans this we got to read because it's a large portion and I want to read all of it I don't want to miss any of it so what we have here is God prophesying something in the past and then he, and now here we are 3,000 centuries in the future in the writings of the apostles and they're telling us that what God declared in Eden has been confirmed in human history and they're making and they're giving us the, the, the ins, giving us insight warnings to be careful because history is being it's playing itself out the way God described it in Genesis the way he described it in Genesis so because of the sin of mankind because of the sin of Adam, mankind perverted and became corrupt so that judgment and destruction was inevitable. Here in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, and became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image, more, an image made rather like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And it goes on to describe the perversion of mankind from the fall of Adam. And that perversion continues. Verse 32, let's finish that. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. Judgment of God on all this behavior, on this perversion. It was the flood. But with the promise of the seed, the promise of the seed of Genesis 3, God, by his power, appointed for himself a remnant of mankind that he preserved for the purpose of restoring all things. From this remnant, he raised up Noah. And so, Second Peter, the Apostle Peter, writes in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, And God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So God brought the flood to destroy all flesh and begin again. Begin again. After the flood, Noah and his three sons entered into covenant with God to restore all things. They were given the same command given to Adam in Genesis 9, to replenish the earth, have dominion over the earth, over the new creation. God promised stability to the new creation. The rainbow was given as the sign of the covenant. The rainbow in the sky means creation will be sustained by God so that the purposes of God can be accomplished, the restoration of all things. From the three sons of Noah, the whole earth was again populated and the restoration began. The restoration of the fall. Pre-flood began, but mankind rebelled against the kingdom of God again and chose independence from God again. Man set in motion a plan to make a name for themselves. They began to build a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. This is Genesis 11. And they determined to disobey God. They said, we will not do your will and not spread across and abroad the face of the earth. We are going to do what we want to do. 
And God steps in. God intervened by dividing and scattering mankind all over the face of the earth. And the nations were created. This is why the nations exist. Because of Babel. Well, let's understand this. Like Adam. Like Adam. Remember what God did with Adam? What did, Adam, what did God do to Adam? He put him outside the garden. He cast him outside the garden. Separated Adam from himself. Right? Like Adam, who was cast out of the garden, God separated this new humanity, mankind, from himself. And he separated them for all, to do only one thing. The only thing that they can do is to serve other gods. Catch that. Understand that. He didn't just scatter them to see what would happen. He knew what would happen. He knew what he did. He allotted to them the gods of the, gods of the world. He separated himself from them, them from himself, so that they could go and serve other gods. Who are these gods? They're demons. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7, when God creates Israel, the nation for himself, and begins to give them the truth, spiritual reality, the way it is, so that they can serve him in spirit and in truth, he tells them in Leviticus 17, 7, as he gives them the way to properly offer sacrifices in a given place designated by God, he says, there shall no longer sacrifice to demons, meaning the way they used to do it. Where did they do that? Egypt. When they were in Egypt. They shall no longer sacrifice to demons. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 and, and 17, as they have gone already through the 40 years in the wilderness, and this is the song that that prophesies about what Israel is going to do in the future when Moses dies and they are in the land. God predicts, God prophesies. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons and not God. To God's small g that they did not know. New arrivals that your father, your fathers before you did not fear. In Psalms 96 verses 1 through 5, the, the psalmist glorifies and exalts and lauds the God of Israel, the true God, and magnifies his name. But then, and then he says, for the gods of the peoples are demons, but the Lord made the heavens. Now, your Bible doesn't say demons. Some of your Bible, most of the Bible doesn't say demons. It says idols. The accurate word is demons. The, the, the one in the manuscripts is Demons. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we go to the Apostle Paul. Does Paul say anything new? No. Advising followers of Jesus how to conduct themselves among the nations and doing business with members of the nations and, and having parties with the nations or having friendship with the nations. He says about them, but I, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything because they have idols and they do stuff with idols? The things, I'm saying that the things which the Gentiles, the nations... Everyone outside Israel sacrificed. They sacrificed to demons and not to God. I do not want you, follower of Jesus Christ, service, servant of the God of Israel, to have anything to do, any fellowship to do with demons. When God scattered the, the people at Babel, he gave them up to demons, to the gods of this world. But he did that, and he did do that. He acted with the future in mind when he would restore mankind back to himself. And this, for this we have to read Acts. Acts 17, the Apostle Paul, as he, as he enters the center of idolatry of his day, uh, 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 Athens, the capital of Greek culture, the highest of the pagan cultures of human history, the most pervasive and influential of Gentile pagan demonic cultures. And he's there because he's preaching the gospel to the Jew first, wherever they are found, and he's in a missionary trip. In Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 15, it says, So those who conducted Paul those who were taking him on these trips, those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, the capital of Greek civilization and culture, and receiving a command uh, for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, 
His spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Who do these idols represent? Demons. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through, the, through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined that pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Everybody believes this outside of Israel, he's saying. Truly, this is a fact. These times of ignorance, that's over. God has over, that, uh, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all, meaning to all the world, by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear of this matter again. The Apostle Paul goes to the center of idolatry, demonic worship, the philosophies of men, the philosophies of this world, and he doesn't come with persuasive words trying to win over an argument. He simply tells them the history that God has created since Genesis because he knows that it's history, because it is a prophetic word of God. God has said, this is the way it is. This is the way man is. This is the way the world is. This is what is happening in the world, and this is the message that God has, for a long time, he overlooked that. But now, because he has accomplished all his plans and purposes through Jesus, everyone must repent. Everyone, meaning the whole planet, must repent. Paul acts and speaks according to the history that God has created by his prophetic word since Genesis 3. And so orienting ourselves with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit means getting into proper relationship with Him. That's what I said at the very beginning. Think about that. Think about that every time that you get up in the morning, you have to make a decision to orient yourself to God. If you don't, you'll go off on your own because you'll hear a song, you'll hear something on television, you'll start talking about saying some things, and before you know it, you're out of step with God. The first thing we always do is orient ourselves with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. But it is impossible to get into proper relationship with God without the knowledge and the understanding of prophecy. You can't orient yourself. You can't position yourself properly to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit without the knowledge of prophecy, without what God has spoken, without knowledge of the history that His, prophes His prophetic word has created. All of that is absolutely necessary to say I'm in proper relationship with God. I'm walking with God. I'm in union with God. I'm in agreement with God. I'm in harmony with God. If we live in ignorance of prophecy, we are living for ourselves. If we are living in ignorance of prophecy, we are living for ourselves according to our own version of reality and who we believe God is and how He acts 
in the world. The prophetic word, the word of, from the mouth of God, establishes the truth of life as it is, unfolding day by day, and the goal of it. In Romans chapter 8, let's read that together. This is so awesome. In Romans chapter 8, 19 through 29. Romans 8, 19 through 29. Now listen to what this says. It's amazing. We have to learn to think this way. Because this is a prophetic word. This is God describing what life is like and what is happening in the world and what is happening behind the scenes. He's ordering spiritual activity and human activity. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, to vanity, emptiness, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope of redemption. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise the, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groaning with, which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, his Son, Yeshua, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's, let me quickly break that down with some commentary, what we just read here. First of all, in verse 19, this is what Paul is saying. Creation, creation, the planet. Creation is waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The planet is waiting for those of us who are sons, former sons of Adam, now sons of God through faith in Jesus, to be fully revealed in the world. To be fully revealed in the world. Those of us who are God's seed and not the seed of the serpent. Because if you know a believer, you know a son of God. If you know an unbeliever, you know, a son of the serpent. There's only, two, there's only two children in the world. There's only two children in the world, two kinds of children in the world, sons of Satan and sons of God. And verse 19 says, creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, those who are gods, those who know God, those who have been born of God. In verse 20 to 21, the apostle says, God himself created the conditions that characterize mankind and creation. It's God's doing. It's God's doing. All things are under his control. He has a plan to deliver mankind and creation from the corruption, from its corruption into the glorious liberty of spiritual life and blessing. The problems of the world, God set them in motion. And God has a solution for it. In verse 22 through verse 25, he says, The creation groans for freedom from corruption. The creation longs for freedom from the corruption that has been imposed upon it. And we who are believers, Paul says, we should be groaning as well. We should be groaning as well, eagerly yearning for our redemption. It should be our hope because we see that we have not yet obtained it in full. Our redemption isn't yet completed. We're waiting. We're waiting. It won't come in its completion, its fullness until the kingdom. And Paul says the, the planet is yearning to be delivered and to be brought into that condition where the sons of God will 
will rule and reign in the creation. And Paul says we should be yearning as well. We should be groaning as well. We should be having that hope because we know it hasn't been fulfilled. We still see the corruption around us and we still see that it affects us. And it touches us. And we yearn for it. We should yearn for it. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. If we grow weak and we forget this hope, the Holy Spirit inside of us, He's yearning for that. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us because He works in us according to God's will. We need to learn to listen to the Spirit of God who will act inside of us, testify in us through the Word. If you're not reading the Word, the Holy Spirit is silent. If you're not reading the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit can't say anything to you. You won't hear what He's saying because the Holy Spirit takes the word you read and then speaks to you. And the main thing that the Holy Spirit speaks to us is to yearn for deliverance, to yearn for redemption, to yearn for the completion of our, of our, of our redemption, to be brought out of this corruption, out of this state that the world is in, and to get the help from the Holy Spirit to yearn like He does and to groan like He does, to pray like He does, because He prays, the Holy Spirit prays according to the prophetic word of God. The Holy Spirit says only what God says. And he is working only toward what God is working. In verse 28, if we are those who believe and love God, Paul says, he will make all things to come our, that come our way to work together for good. That's why you can get in step with God. Get in step with his prophetic word. Do his words, do his works. Because whatever happens in that, God will bring a good outcome of whatever may, we may go through as we wait for the redemption of of creation and our own redemption. All things work together for good to those of us who are his. In verses 29 to verse 30, Paul says, history is unfolding according to the foreknowledge of God. History is unfolding according to the foreknowledge of God, according to his predetermined plan. No coincidences in history. He raised up Jesus to be the firstborn among many brethren. Some of us don't see Jesus this way. We just see him up there sitting down waiting for us to join him in heaven. That's not what God intended for Jesus. God sent Jesus to be the first of many. To be the firstborn of many brethren, meaning that God sent Jesus to be the pattern of how mankind would look like, how he would speak, how he would act, how he would work in the world. And we would follow precisely the pattern of Jesus' life. And so he says, God raised up Jesus to be the firstborn among many brethren. Those of us whom he has called, he says, he will redeem. If you are a believer, you have this promise. God is involved in your life to redeem you, to save you, to justify you, and to glorify you with himself. Here's God involved in human activity, spiritual and human activity. In Colossians chapter 1, go over there very quickly. I want to be able to get to the end of this. I hope that I can. In Colossians chapter 1, another long portion, but it is also important to read this, to catch it all and not just read pieces of one or two verses, but to get the whole message. The entire chapter 1, Colossians 1, Paul the Apostle. Let's begin in verse 3. We give thanks to God. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, the believers at Colossae, since we heard of your faith in Jesus the Christ and of your love for all those who believe in him as well, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you, of which you heard before the word, in the word rather, of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not, give, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the assembly of the Lord, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, that he may be above all. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. And by him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, to God, by him, Jesus. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who believe in Jesus, were, once were alienated and enemies in your mind. By wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, to fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the assembly, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to believers. To them God will to make known which are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, among the nations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of being glorified with God. Him we preach, Jesus warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man complete in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. The prophetic word establishes the reality that mankind serves the God of Israel and Jesus Christ, or demons, or demons. The prophetic word reveals that interactions with demons primarily and characteristically involves sexual perversion and child sacrifice. Now I'm going to the point of all of this. Let's read that. Now I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because what I what I'm want us to understand is that the prophetic word creates history. Past history, present history is going to create tomorrow and it's going to create the end. And you have to understand that about prophecy and and your understanding about the world past present and future must be based on the prophetic word of god on nothing else anything else is a deception is a lie is a lie and this is why it is so important that we grasp this and we're going to be talking about of course about it forever until yeshua comes because we need to in leviticus chapter 18 what is this what did i say the prophetic word reveals that interactions uh, in the world by human beings is either worship of the God of Israel or Jesus or demons. It also reveals that interactions with demons primarily and characteristically involve sexual perversion and child sacrifice. This is how you know that demonic activity is happening. Who says that? God does. God does. In his prophetic word. So in Leviticus 18, he has created Israel. He's brought them out of Egypt. He's giving them the way to worship and the understanding of how to live in the midst of nations. The nations that they're going to be surrounded by when he plants them in the land of Canaan. In Leviticus 18, chapter 18, beginning at verse 3. We've read this many times. Let's read it again. According to the doings of the land of Egypt, he tells the children of Israel where you lived you shall not do. Forget what you learned in Egypt. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Don't learn new ways. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. The word walk means lifestyle. You won't do these things as a way of life, a lifestyle. But he says, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them because I am Yahweh, your God. Meaning, the nations have their gods, and they do things a certain way, but 
but I am your God, and I want you to live life a certain way. And then what, how, what does, how does he begin to instruct them? He says, you keep my judgment as he begins to give them judgment. In verse 6, none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness because I am Yahweh. And if you continue reading the entire chapter, it's all about what we would call sexual perversion. He's teaching them how not to participate in sexual perversion because who's doing this? The Canaanites, the nations, they are committing sexual perversion. Why? Because the demons require it. The gods that they serve, the demons require it. Verse 21 of this same chapter, he says, You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord your God. I am Yahweh. To pass through the fire simply means sacrifice children. Don't kill children. How can you kill children? First, you have to have children. You have to give birth to children so you can kill them. This is what the worshipers of Moloch did. They had children to kill them. Demonic activity. And as he lists a series, and he will do it several, several more times, as he lists the, that that he considers sexual perversion, he injects this, don't kill your children. And this is something that he will say over and over because this is characteristic of demonic activity. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, if you can't just say it once, he has to say it over and over and over because this is a reality of life. This is the reality of life and it has not changed. It has not changed. In Deuteronomy 12, 28. Observe and obey all these words which I command you, the Torah of Moses, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is right in the sight of God, in the sight of the Lord your God. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, watch yourselves that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods. Why? Because the gods are demons. Saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. Don't bring it into my worship. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. A few chapters forward in chapter 18, Deuteronomy 18. Verses 9 through 12. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abomination of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or practice witchcraft, soothsayer, interprets omens, sorcerers, ones who conjures up spells, mediums, spiritists who call up the dead. All these things and all who do these things or an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. In chapter 19 of Jeremiah, this is the command of God to Israel before they enter the land. By the days of Jeremiah, they have entered the land. They have been established in the land. Jeremiah 19, verse 1. To verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen flask, and take some of the elders of the people, and some of the elders of the priests, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the potter's gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle. Because they have forsaken me, 
and made this an alien place because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. Imagine the death of a child in this way, the deliberate death of a child never came into the mind of God. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that this place shall no, long, shall no more be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give us meat for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth. I will make this city a desolate and a hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hissed because of its plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his friend in the siege and in the desperation with which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. The judgment upon Israel who insisted on doing the ways of the nations knowing that they were following the ways of demons. We need to accept and be moved to righteous indignation that our culture is being led backwards. Our American culture is being led backwards from the fear and the worship of the Lord to the worship of and service to demons. And for that, I want to read an article, and I'll finish here. This is from Bill Muhlenberg, his website or his page, whatever you, want, whatever you call it, is Culture Watch. And it's, this is the article that, that he posted today. Under this title, listen, No More Comfortable Christianity, Time for Prophetic Proclamation and Confrontation. Do you understand that title? It's, it's time with what happened in New York and Virginia and all this stuff that is going on around us, that is progressing rapidly. This is what this article is about. He's addressing those things. He's from Australia, but he's, he's commenting on what is happening in America, but also what is happening in Australia, because Australia isn't that far behind. And for this, I'm going to need another pair of eyes, because the typing is very, very small. So let me read this, that Bill Muhlenberg writes in his article titled, No More Comfortable Christianity, Some Time. It's time for believers to begin to proclaim the prophetic word of God and be confrontational in the culture. He goes on and describes the situation that we know, we know and understand in our culture, every, every aspect of perversion. And then he quotes an article by an individual called Charles Pope. Actually, he's a Catholic uh, monsignor. He had written this article for Catholics two years ago. And this is what this monsignor, I don't know what, position exactly that is, but he writes this as a wake-up call to his fellow Catholics, and it serves just as well for everyone else. This is what he wrote. We are at war for our own souls and the souls of people we love. We are at war for the soul of this culture and nation. And like any soldier, we must train to fight well. This is a growing consternation among believers, at least in her leadership because her leadership is living in the past. It seems that there is no awareness that we are at war and that he, and the Catholics, he said, need to be summoned to sobriety, increasing separation from the wider culture and courageous witness and increasing martyrdom. Can you imagine that being preached from a pulpit in a Catholic church, much less, you know, in a Catholic church and any church? Be, uh, you know, fellow, fellow brothers and sisters, we need to get sober, separate ourselves from the culture, be courageous in our witnessing, and, you know, be willing to die. And not necessarily physically, but really suffer loss for being a believer and for speaking out. And he continues, It is long past dark in our culture, but in most parishes and dioceses, it is business as usual in most places in the body of Christ. It is business as usual, and there is anything but the sober alarm that is really necessary in times like these. Scripture says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and fingers for battle. That's Psalm 144, verse 1. 
Preparing people for war, a moral and spiritual war, not a shooting war, should include a clear setting forth of the errors of our time, what is happening in our culture, and a clear and loving application of the truth to error and light to darkness. But there is little such training evident in Catholic circles, in Christian circles, evangelical circles, today, where in the average assembly there exists a sort of shy and quiet atmosphere, a fear of addressing quote, controversial issues, lest someone be offended, or the congregation be perceived as, quote, unwelcoming. But if, this, if, but if ever there was a time to wear soft garments, it is not now. He concludes as follows, it is time, past time, to retool, get equipped. It is time to prepare for persecutions that will get bolder by the month and the year. The dark moments that marched in under the banner of tolerance never meant it. And having increasingly gained powers, they are seeking to criminalize anyone who resists their vision. No tolerance for us. Religious liberty is eroding and compulsory compliance is already everywhere. The federal courts increasingly shift to militantly secular and activist judges who legislate from the bench. When will we, as a church, finally say to the bureaucrats who demand we comply with evil laws, quote, we will not comply. If you fine us, we will not pay. If you seek to confiscate our buildings, we will turn maximum publicity against you, but we will not comply. If you arrest us, off to jail we go, but we will not comply with evil laws or cooperate with evil. Right now, most of us can barely imagine our leaders standing up so firm, quiet compromise and jargon-filled, quote, solutions will be a grave temptation to a church ill-prepared for persecution. Call me an alarmist or call me idealist, but I hope we find our spine before it's too late. It is usually a faithful remnant that saves the day in the biblical story, the biblical narrative. I, play, I pray only for the strength to be in that faithful remnant. Will you join me too? Let's pray and start retooling. Let's equip ourselves now. Only our unambiguous faith can save us or anyone we love. Pray for strong and courageous faith. Muhlenberg continues, Yes, all believers need to find their spine and find it fast. More than ever, the church of Jesus Christ today needs prophetic warriors, not couch potatoes, compromisers, and cowards. Where are those who will stand up and be counted? Where are those who will face the many challenges we find all around us and say, this far and no further? Where are those who will renounce comforts, pleasures, and the praise of men and take a stand for their Lord, regardless of the repercussions? Without them, the church in the West appears to be all but gone. As A.W. Tozer put it, quote, Yes, if evangelical Christianity is to stay alive, she must have men again, the right kind of men. She must repudiate the weaklings who dare not speak out, and she must seek in prayer and much humility the coming again of men of the stuff prophets and martyrs are made of. Sure, such prophets will be hated, not only by the world, but by the comfortable and the craven pew warmers as well. As Vance Havner said, quote, Prophets are very disturbing to smug church members who like to sit half asleep in church on Sunday morning while the minister drones platitudes that offend nobody. And again, quote, Prophets have never been plentiful and the species is threatened with extinction. And one more quote, we need a John the Baptist in America today to call the nation and the church to repentance. And he goes on to give other examples, but the point is clearly made, don't you think? It is, did he say truth? He does say truth. This is the point of all of this that we shared this morning. We're recovering the true gospel, the gospel sent from God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, so that by his spirit, God can bring us into agreement with himself, so that we may speak his words and do his works. Because of yourself, there's not enough 
to, to, to compel you to do this that is being described here? How do you become these individuals that they're describing? The John the Baptist, the prophets with backbone and with spine, the ones who don't care about offending. Not, not that you go and step on everybody, but that you say the truth, this truth, this truth. God has, the one, God has to be the one to give us a revelation and the understanding of his prophetic plan. And he has to capture our hearts with that prophetic plan. And then he sets us on fire. That's never going to happen if you don't know. If you don't know what the words of the prophets are. If you don't know the things that are described as prophetic, that God said, this is the way that it will be. And then watch him as he works out history. And there remains no, no question that the God of Israel is God. And that the history that he is creating uh, is the history of his own heart and of his own plans. And it is for redemption. It is for salvation. It is for the deliverance of the perversion and the corruption that we see all around us. And that we are called to be like Jesus. Jesus who said, I only speak the words of God. I only speak the words of God. I only speak the words that I hear my father speak. That doesn't mean that Jesus, that Jesus only ha is always walking around with his ear trying to see what God is saying. No, no, he's, he's, in, the, he's in the Bible. He's in the Torah. He's in the words of the prophets. He reads it. And the Spirit speaks out, out of that the way he always does. And he hears and then he says and he preaches. And then he does the works of God. I only do the works that I see my father doing. How do you, how do you know the works that your father is doing? By, by looking at redemptive history in the past, what God did all through past history, his redemptive acts, his saving acts, and the words of the Torah that tell us what a redemptive lifestyle looks like, what it means to be in agreement with God, what it means to be keeping in step with God. We read in several places in which we, we read Jesus is the firstborn couple of places of many brethren keep that in mind Jesus cannot be to us anyone else until he is this first the pattern for our lives the pattern for our lives thank God that he saves us and and gives us a place in the kingdom and gives us a place in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem but the right here and the right now the before that happens is to become more and more like him is to become more and more like him and it isn't to become meek and milk toast that everybody steps on you because you're trying to be so humble and kind. No, it is to be the bold, the bold prophet that he was who said, this is what the Lord has said, like all the prophets before him. And he laid down his life for the will and the plan and the purpose of God. We cannot be anything less than who Jesus was. This is why we're studying. This is why we're recovering the gospel of the kingdom because only the gospel of the kingdom will either set you aflame for God or you'll say no, just like the nations at Babel. Because a halfway response is as good as a no. It's either a yes and you're set aflame, or you, or you vacillate between yes or no, and it's, as far as God is concerned, it's a no. And if you stay there long enough, you're in danger of God hardening your heart. We are in danger of God hardening our heart because we won't make the decision that is obvious to make. History is working out the way God has ordained it. He is directing it. He is directing the spiritual forces and humanity to accomplish the consummation, which is the liberation of the creation from its bondage, the bondage that he put upon it, and to reveal those whom he has birthed into this world, to make known to all those whom he has birthed into his kingdom by his gospel and by his spirit. These are the days to take all of that so seriously because our world is rapidly reverting to the way it was before the Lord called Israel, rather before the Lord called Abraham and created Israel. I want to, to understand that. The world is going rapidly to the way it was before God, after the Tower of Babel, called Abraham, created Israel, and brought truth and light into creation. The reality is that you're not worshiping the God of Israel and Jesus the Christ. You are worshiping the gods of this world, the gods of this age, and they are demons. And they will take you to perversion and to corruption the way we see it in our culture, and ultimately to destruction. You and I must do something about that. Let's pray that God ignites us with the passion that he has for the redemption and the salvation of mankind and creation. It begins... It begins with us understanding that as, that as God is working out his plan, he is saving Israel first. 
And we're, we're going to talk about that more and more and more to understand that this is the plan of God to the Jew first and then to the nations. So many things that we have to set in order by the will of God, by the grace of God, he's going to accomplish that in us who are willing. Let's stand.